That's why we have this conversation now. We are, you know, we are born and bred, you know, in the in the in the judicial system, and we 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 are passionate about it. We are passionate about the rule of law. We love the courts. I mean, our, forget about our bread and butter. I think it is courts are the only bulwark against against aut autocracy. So we are having this conversation, not because we want to criticize anybody, we're having this conversation to improve the system. And, so, and these conversations sometimes are taken amiss, as if we are against A, B, or C judge. We are against nobody. We're for the independence of the judiciary. I think we need to make that clear to the public who are going to watch this program. Namaskar. In this episode of Dilse, incidentally, Dilse uh, is a platform where we have conversations uh, with uh, people who are experts in their field so that information may reach the people of this country. So in this episode of Dilse, we're going to talk about the judiciary, especially in the context of the fact that a particular judge, uh, Justice Abhijit uh, Gangopadhyaya uh, managed to travel from uh, being a judge to the ballot box. Now that was a rather short journey of his because within 48 hours of his giving up or resigning as a judge, he joined the Bhartiya Janta Party. Why do we take the example of Abhijit Gangopadhyaya? Because we get the feeling that there are lots of people in the judiciary who have inclinations towards political parties. Does that all go well for the judiciary? That's something that we're going to discuss. In the case of Abhijit Gangopadhyaya, he had been a judge uh, in the Calcutta High Court and was holding a particular roster for deciding certain cases. And while he was a judge, he started giving interviews to channels. He was reprimanded by the Supreme Court of India. Some of his orders were stayed. In one particular order, his order was stayed by the division bench. Despite the stay, he continued uh, disregarding the order of the division bench. So there is an element of gungho-ness about all this. So we're going to discuss all that and much more about the judiciary because I think that the that the malaise lies in the manner in which we appoint our judges. And we're going to discuss that as well. So I have three extraordinary guests with me today. Um, Dushyan Dave has been a president of the Supreme Court Bar Association on three occasions. He's a senior advocate. He shifted to Delhi in 1986. Um, I can say about all the three judges, uh, all the three guests of mine, that the one quality that they have is courage. Very few lawyers in this country have courage. Dushyan Dave is one of them. He has fought many a battle and he is quite upfront and honest about his opinions. He also writes articles in newspapers. On the right side is Prashant Bhushan, who needs no introduction. Um, he was the one who started the movement of India against corruption. He was the one who moved the Supreme Court in the alleged 2G scam. Uh, he also uh, filed a petition in public interest to cancel uh, the coal blocks. Uh, and of course, those matters were decided in favor of the PIL petitioners. Uh, he's been very upfront also, has a lot of courage, has been filing and recently, of course, the uh, electoral bonds case. He was at the forefront of that case as well. So he also is a lawyer who has enormous courage. And on my left uh, is Binakshi Arora, who is also a senior advocate. And uh, I might just tell you that uh, uh, she was recommended for judgeship to the Supreme Court. And she declined. And she declined. Now, this, is, this, is, this, this tells you that, you know, here is a, a lawyer who has courage to say no, even if uh, an appointment is offered to her. So let's start with, do you think that this malaise which is reflected in the actions of Abhijit Gangopadhyaya uh, 
is, uh, is symptomatic of what's the state of the judiciary in our country, Roshan? Well, let us understand first thing, and I think which is what people must understand, that if you do not have fiercely independent judiciary, then there is no rule of law in this country and democracy is at peril. So it's one thing that judges can have political aspirations in their private thoughts, nothing wrong about it. They, they can't be living in ivory towers. But for judges to harbor political rewards and in the hope of those rewards to conduct themselves as judges on the bench is something which has only developed in last few years. And there are classic examples of that which are, you know, beginning with uh, Chief Justice Sadasivam, then uh, uh, came Chief Justice Gogoi, uh, then uh, came uh, Justice, Chief Justice Nazir, and now comes Justice Gangopadhyay. All these judges have given judgments after judgments in favor of the ruling party at the center, the Bharatiya Janata Party, and have been rewarded. Now, the difficulty arises this, Kapil, that we are now therefore sending, these judges are sending a clear-cut message to the judiciary across the country that you toe in line, you do what the party in power wants you to do and you will be rewarded. Now that is the worst message which has gone from this. Can I remind you what Arun Jaitley said in parliament? He said a pre-retirement, a post-retirement favor is the result of a pre-retirement judgment. Absolutely. Right? I That's agree. what he said. Now, I, I would have thought that the BJP should have been cognizant of that. No, I, what, what is worrying me is that how far these judges were in touch with the bar, uh, party in power, how far they were talking to them to compromise their judgments. That is something which will never come out. And someday, you know, I mean, someday, uh, if it does come out, it is going to be a, a you know, revelation that they have been in intimate contact with, like Justice Gangopadhyay. I mean, it is impossible to conceive that he would resign and within 24 hours he'll be, you know, welcomed no, he by publicly, He Party. publicly stated that I'm in touch yes. with the BJP. So, I mean, it's, it's something so disgusting. And if this is the state of affairs of the judiciary, I think we have a lot to worry about. Jean? No, this, uh, Justice Gangopadhyay's case is a particularly egregious case because it is not even a case of a post-retirement job or soon after retirement job being given to a judge. It is a case where uh, he resigns and immediately joins within a Within 48 hours. Within 48 hours joins a political party and then admits that he was in touch while he was a judge with that political party, that he had been talking to that political party even while he was a judge. All the while he was giving judgments in politically sensitive matters involving that political party. So, uh, but even this uh, general malaise which Dushant mentioned about post-retirement jobs being given to judges soon after retirement. It's not just the three cases that he mentioned. Those there three. Many more. Ranganath Mishra way back. Ha, huh, nee, these were, uh, these judges were given governorships or memberships of the Raj Sabha, but there are others like take Arun Mishra, who was given chairmanship of the National right. Human Rights Commission, gave any number of judgments in favor. And the Lokpal now. And now the current Lokpal, uh, Justice Kanvilkar, who gave any number of judgments in favor of the government. And now he's been appointed Lokpal, I mean, soon after his retirement. So this is a very, very serious problem. In fact, uh, what Justice uh, Gangopadhyay has done goes against the code of conduct of judges because uh, and if he had not resigned, I mean, I don't think any action can be taken against him since he has resigned. Uh, I don't know whether his pension can be stopped, etc. Though that's not of much con consequence. But had he been a judge and had he been talking to a political party, that's clear violation of the code if of... If I may ask you, he was holding this roster from 2022. What he was doing on the bench was known to his brother judges and the chief justice of the Calcutta High Court. It was known to his judges who are from Calcutta and the Supreme Court. And it must have been come, come to the knowledge of the chief justice of India. So why would this, this go on for almost two, two years? Because yeah. from 22 to 24, all this was happening. Why was nobody taking action? I, I think nobody is now left with courage. The Chief Justice is 
particularly of various high courts or the Supreme Court to take any action against their brother or the sister. Justice of India did stay orders, did pass some strict Yeah, order. but that's neither here nor there because these are, according to me, I mean, I may be wrong. You know this branch of law much better than I do. But these are clear-cut cases of corruption. What else is this if not corruption? That you are sitting on a bench, you are talking to a political party, giving them judgments, uh, you know, while, I mean, in discussion with them as per their requests, as per their suggestions. And then as soon as you step down, you are rewarded with a very important position. So, I mean, this is ultimately, it's, I think it's really the lowest uh, thing that can ever happen to a judge. A judge is supposed to maintain dignity, is supposed to maintain aloofness, he is supposed to be really, you know, uh, independent of executive. That's what was expected when judiciary well, was the created. The very concept of being a judge means that you are far removed from politics in the sense that you don't play politics when you're on the bench or you don't favor a party. That's the whole, the whole idea of independence of the judiciary is founded on that. Now, uh, Minakshi, I want your thoughts on it. I find something else actually much more worrisome. I think Justice Gangopadhyay came to the bench only sometime in the year 2017 or 18, if I'm not mistaken. So his tenure is precisely just about five years. Now, he openly conducted himself against the ruling party in West Bengal, very openly, made open statements, passed, let me say, populist orders, if I may call it, because his orders and judgments got struck down by the Supreme Court. So, if you have a judge who shows that inclination on the bench, trying to take it to a populist level, garner that populist image, I am the one who's doing the right thing. I am setting the systems right. There is an inclination of what is coming. And then you resign within a span of just five years and, and you enter into the politics. I think this kind of a thing to use judiciary as a stepping stone to make an image for yourself, conduct yourself in a manner, and then to go into politics is something that's even more worrisome. And I say this for the reason. It's not that we haven't had judges who moved from the judiciary to the politics. We had Baharul Islam from the Supreme Court. So we've had others who actually left and went into. Justice Hegde. Justice Hegde was so, the Lok Sabha. Hidayatullah. Hidayatullah. He was chairman so, and but, vice president. But each one of this judge had a certain length of career. It was not a case of populist building yourself up for the next level and openly conducting yourself from the bench in a particular manner, which was, if I may say, more populist in nature, to garner that, build up that image for the next plank. I think this particular thing that has happened is the most worrisome thing. If we were going to attract that kind of people into judiciary who would come to use it as a plank, for the next to catapult themselves to the next level is something that I find but you know, there are, extremely worrisome. There are so many examples, not just, we're not, we are talking about some of the prominent examples, but in states, many of the judges have been given, given uh, posts, uh, you know, within government after their retirement. Yes. You know, there are many such examples. In Gyanwapi case, for example, the district judge has just been appointed Lokpal. Of a university. Of a university. I mean, what's happening in our country? That's called Therefore, incentivizing. So what you for need, what judgments. I think we need, is a cooling off period. I feel that uh, rather than cooling off period, more important thing is to uh, com to say that uh, the government cannot have anything at all to do with any post-retirement jobs of judges. So, it has to be done by a completely independent body. So, I have been saying that even judges, uh, instead of just this collegium system, there needs to be a, a full-time independent body called the National Judicial Appointments Commission, which is not of the kind which was designed earlier, which had the law minister and three judges as ex officio, but a full-time body. That kind of body should decide as to whether a judge and which judge should be given what post-retirement job. And the government should have absolutely nothing to do with it. No, in yeah. fact, I think the government should have nothing to do with the appointment of judges at all. If you start looking at examples around the world, for example, Kenya, South Africa, the UK, it, 
in the in the judicial services commission in kenya and in south africa there is no representative of the executive at all in the selection of of judges in the uk called the independent selection commission there is no representative of the executive at all so therefore this argument that is being raised that basic structure of the constitution why should the executive be left out in the admission in the election process doesn't exist anymore in the liberal democracies of the world so we should move towards that direction and i agree with you entirely but while that will take time there should be a cooling off period i think see the difficulty kapil is today that i mean collegium system was conceived uh, to really ensure that uh, fiercely independent and meritorious judges are appointed that was the entire purpose of the judgment uh, second judges judgment case in 1992 but we have seen that the worst appointments have been made during the college under the collegium system and uh, i mean uh, many high courts i mean i hear constantly from you know wherever i go or uh, whichever high court i travel to uh, lawyers are now seriously complaining about erosion of values amongst judges and it has become it's not just a financial problem it's not just problem of efficiency it's a problem of ideological uh, judges and these ideological judges are not willing to you know give uh, justice as is required for people as is supposed to be delivered and that is a big challenge so what are you going to do with this hundreds and hundreds of judges who are already appointed in high courts they will soon come to supreme court some of many of them so you know for a long time the institution is definitely under serious challenge very i just have some slight uh, disagreement on this you see while the collegium system is not a very good system i agree with that because there is still a lot of arbitrary and nepotistic appointments taking place in this system but this at least led to somewhat more independent judges being appointed than if the appointments were with the government as I, compared with that i'm sorry i won't be able to agree to that see so so let me just complete uh, now what the government the present government has done unfortunately it has stalled the appointment of independent judges by either sitting on the recommendations of the collegium if they recommend independent judges which is not always the case but when they recommend independent judges the government either sits over those recommendations or alternatively when they send the names back and the names are unanimously reiterated even then they sit over th that and they just don't issue the notification so this is how the government that's true but the same collegium simultaneously sends many names which are undesirable you see i tell you the problem my own view is the following the moment the executive is part of the process no system can work for the simple reason in the collegium system the executive is tell the collegium look you have five vacancies right you take two or you take three give us two now if you say give us two that's the kind of judge that you're talking about who will be appointed he will then be appointed at a young age he will become come to the supreme court and that that ideological instinct and bent of mind will be reflected in his judgments and in his orders so as long as the executive is part of the process it will always be polluted that's my belief what do you say i think you're absolutely right and uh, unfortunately although a judge is expected that once he takes his oath he is going to leave his own personal views behind and be true to the constitution it really never happens that's true it doesn't happen so you will have some degree of ideology i do expect anyone will have that but to have a selection based only on ideology it's that is definitely not acceptable because as you talk about where there is a trade off or it's a quid pro quo i give you 3 i take 2 yeah. those two will be only there because of their ideology and leaning now the three may have an ideology one way or the other as you said they can't live in their ivory towers they may have views but these two are the one whom you would get only with that particular ideology and that's not a criteria for selection of a judge this is not even ideology uh, it is just partisanship yeah, yeah, i yeah, agree yeah, with yeah, you yeah, you yeah. put it I much mean, better i mean some of these people have no ideology at all 
they they just want to be there so that uh, but there is also an atmosphere general atmosphere of fear and uh, which is prevailing in the country which perhaps also dissuades judges from giving independent decisions and trying to toe the line of party power and that's something which is worrisome i don't know how how far it can be stopped how far it can be you know stalled but that seems to be affecting many a decisions as but that that dushan depends on the independence of the institution of the judiciary if the highest court sends a message then the message will percolate down i agree so this is the the problem is there yes it it but it must start from the top the highest court must show fierce independence because you know in last few years i mean uh, uh, there is there was a great hope from chief justice chandrachud and let us hope that he lives up to that hope till september uh, but before that the, you know under various chief justices we saw a steady and continuous decline in independence of supreme court in more than one way and that is something which uh, I, i mean they may not have been ideological judges but they were certainly judges who were willing to toe the line of the party in power and which uh, in every which way so it was not in just judgments it was also in appointment of high court and supreme court judges uh, it was also in allocation of cases to various benches so it was also in appointment of post retirement you know uh, judges dushan the most pernicious thing that they do is they appoint a judge who is ideologically or quote unquote inclined then put a particular person as chief justice of a high court then he become the master of the roster there and then those sensitive cases of the state are then uh, then assigned now that's a very 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 pernicious thing that's happening in our i agree with you now i always say that you have to find ways out of this whole this thing change the system but i said this here that you have judges you are incentivizing these judges because the judgments that are rendered by them are for a particular incentives later on which is a trade off also for them as post retirees it's a clear quid pro quo it's a clear quid pro quo so therefore and there is a study that is very interesting i just happen to be looking at it which said judges who require retire sometime mid term not be close to an election are more used for incentivizing because there is a term of that particular government to give them the rewards when they retire and they also reported in this particular study that judges who retire much closer to closure of a term of a government will probably not render because then you do not know which way the things would go this is a study that's carried out after various data and past if you look at it you see that every time the judgments have been delivered one way or the other and more often than not favoring the government favoring the government against the rights of citizens whether it is or on the general issues every single judge has been incentivized post retirement whether it's appointment to certain positions whatever as we discuss shortly so therefore now what either you have a complete cooling off period you have to have a cooling off period and that also takes care of judges like justice abhijit gangopadhyay if you cannot join a political party you cannot take an office and i will not say one year i would say at least 3 years no it should be the term of the government if you ask me that's yes. the cooling off period yes exactly so there has to be a way to come out of it otherwise if they lose their credibility the way they are doing i don't think you have an independent judiciary and then our judiciary is going to be i've said this earlier on prashant's talk also that we are going to be then no different to what you have in russia china iran other places where the world does not look at them as to do justice but always looks at them as employees of the government well so far we are far removed from that i have yeah. to say but, that but but we may land up there i, I hope not i don't think that we may just I, land I up i have confident that that will not i have confident that that will not happen but i think uh, you know to to achieve any measure of success kapil uh, and i am sure you will agree that the role played by the bar association and the advocates is going to be extremely crucial bar associations are strong the advocates are willing to stand up and speak about it uh, you know it's never going to stop because it's within the system if we are not able to you know speak 
then how is it a common man is going to understand what the problems are so i think that's, that's why we have this conversation now we are you know we are born and bred you know in the in the in the judicial system and we 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 are passionate about it we are passionate about the rule of law we love the courts i mean our, forget about our bread and butter i think it is courts are the only bulwark against against the auto autocracy so we are having this conversation not because we want to criticize anybody we are having this conversation to improve the system and so, and these conversations sometimes are taken amiss as if we are against a b or c judge we are against nobody we are for the independence of the judiciary i think we need to make that clear to the public who are going to watch this program yeah and i think it's not just that the bar of course the bar needs to be uh, active about the independence of the judiciary and should raise its voice and it has happened in many countries including in pakistan where the bar has really come to the rescue of the of a embattled judiciary from uh, the government and has rescued the judiciary from the government but it's also civil society in general which has to be active or and proactive on matters involving the judiciary because ultimately it is really the civil society which is impacted by a judiciary which loses its independence so therefore uh, ultimately the general civil society also has to be vigilant and active in protecting and speaking about uh, what's going on in the judiciary but you know the members of the bar are leaders of those civil society so actually they are the ones who can generate that kind of uh, you know not only generate but to make them understand the ramifications and implications of this kind of a conduct it is a grossest misconduct on a part of a judge who has been you know speaking openly in favor of a ruling party at the center and against the ruling party in the state not only you know from the bench but also in his orders and then he resigns and next day is sitting on a dais with honorable prime minister and shaking hands i mean that's something which is so Not unacceptable shaking hands but you need very strong <laughs> leaders <laughs> on the bar itself he went to a public meeting along with the law, um, uh, in the cpm meeting where the lawyer he was standing with is arguing before him in court and he was shaking you know he was in a public meeting but anyway my, i ask you this question and i it's a very sensitive question why are the leaders of the bar not being vocal about the issues that we are debating today look sir kapil you must understand one thing to take a stand or to, to swim against the tide you must be prepared to make a sacrifice unless you are willing to make a sacrifice you know because you perceive that if i take a stand against the ruling party or against you know the misconduct of a judge or a particular chief justice i am likely to lose my briefs or i am likely to no, but that weakens the bar no correct but that's that's really what is now uh, is uh, the measure unfortunately the measure is not you know that generation of lawyers who were there in, during independent struggle who sacrificed everything that they had their peace of mind their material resources and spent uh, years in jail be it mahatma gandhi be it jawaharlal nehru be it sardar vallabh bhai patel you name them they sacrifice so much and it is therefore really surprising that in 75 years these group of you know uh, lawyers who got freedom for this country have suddenly lost courage to stand up and speak today that really is unbelievable it's something which is not understandable at all actually it is not even this fear that lawyers and sometimes judges also have that if i speak against the uh, the current actions of the judiciary i will be victimized or the judges feel yes. that if i give a judgment against the government i will be victimized etc that's mostly an unfounded fear it's unfortunate it's unfortunate that uh, uh, people have become so psychologically weak clay footed that that they are they don't realize i mean i have seen this and i have realized this that actually no uh, consequences visit you when you stand up for the right thing uh, actually uh, this is just a unfounded fear which is uh, now 
psychologically affecting weak people. So the people have to just rise above that and uh, nothing will happen to them, neither to lawyers nor to judges. I don't know. I have a slightly different take. I think uh, as a nation, we are very strongly somewhere down losing what is called a character. And I think uh, there are a lot of things that are responsible for them. Uh, I remember when I was in a school, apart from teaching me my history, geography and mathematics, there was a very strong character building exercise in the school. That, that doesn't happen anymore. So we produce uh, now citizens who may be very well educated, qualified, but there is no character building that has gone into. And I think some part of what you see, that lack of strength of character, the lack of uh, willing to stand up for causes, even at to your own peril, where you believe you're right, or to live for your own conscience is very often missing. There is a small segment still there, but largely you don't. And sometimes our leaders are laughing stocks. I'm sorry to say, we have that presently in some of our associations. And we can't call them as really the leaders of the bar or leaders who will lead our youngsters. Okay, let's shift to another subject and I want your opinion on it. That in, in, in many jurisdictions, the selection of judges is based on search committees, um, number of vacancies, people applying for a job of a judge. They're being interviewed. They're being asked, what are your values? What judgments you like? If you were to- They have to write an essay. To write an essay. So this whole process is televised, is open, is open to the public. Why can't we have the same system here? No, even if it is not open, you see in America it is... America is different because they are ideologically inclined, but in, 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 in as I told you, in Kenya and UK, it's open. And Kenya is a very strong, very independent strong. Supreme, Supreme Court. Absolutely. Very strong but independent whether Supreme it is Court. open or not, see, to my mind, the more important thing is, that you have to lay down a detailed criteria for the job of a judge. Ki what are the qualities that you are looking for? And how would you evaluate a, a, any person on those qualities? Unfortunately, in India, if you ask any chief justice, because they, have not, they don't have a laid down criteria, ki how do you select judges? They'll say, we look at competence and we look at integrity, as if those are the only two qualities which are necessary in a judge, judicial temperament and understanding of the state of uh, uh, society in this sensitivity, sensitivity. So in, in UK, they have, they have a criteria of more than 10 attributes on the basis of which they evaluate potential candidates. Correct, correct. And then they, they select some of them only. Yes. They sort it, they sort it out. And, and it's, a, it's a full-time committee. But I must say one thing, that in second judge's judgment, most of these criteria have been laid down. And yet nobody follows them. No collegium has ever followed. Them. Therefore, Prashant, when you say no, you can have the criteria. As long as it's a closed-door system, you know, those criteria will... I mean, there has to be transparency. Uh, transparency means open. You know, they, it should be open to the public. Who is going to be our judge, we should know. Just as you want to... Who, who should be elected as our politician, we should know. We also want to know who should be our judge. So that should be the basic... See, when constitution was made, uh, the power to the president to appoint judges of the High Court and Supreme Court in consultation was Chief Justice of India. It was never thought that the office of the Chief Justice of India or President of India would not be of the height which was expected by the constitutional framers. So they repose that faith in these high offices, thinking that people with highest caliber and character uh, will be you know, occupying these offices and they will make such great appointments. So you are right, that's the reason why we really need to do something about it. And sooner we do it, I think realization must also be on the part of the political class because they must realize that today they are in power, tomorrow they will not be in power. 
and therefore they need a judiciary which is independent which is fiercely you know free from any kind of bias and which can give them justice as and when even they need but it. we need yeah. men of that quality to be on those benches no yes that's that's the, and if but you but also uh, while you really need men of that quality to be on the bench women women too women too men and women but i also say that now that you have the motley lot out there you can still do something about it you have the national judicial academy i would like to know that do you really train also your judges to recognize the pitfalls to recognize how to avoid those pitfalls they're going to happen i mean it's a part of that exercise when you sit on the chair the temptations are going to be there the incentives are going to be shown to you we know it we've seen it all the time do you sit and train your judges to recognize where they are coming and how is their code of conduct to happen i think i would like to know whether the national judicial academy for its judges at least does some kind of a training program to make them realize that these are the clear no's and these are the do's and the don'ts but i i'm not sure if Minachi, they have what you're saying is right it's too idealistic probably I, I, i think what you're saying is right it should be done in an ideal environment but, but, we are but not there. look at look at our law judiciary which judge dares give bail to people in sensitive matters to people no judge no one dares it's that fear that we're talking about and if he does give bail you know what's going to happen to him so 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 it's not so actually easy actually nothing will happen to him it's the fear uh, which has unfortunately no, no, got him no no cr will be spoiled you're wrong his cr will be spoiled his promotion prospects will go this is all that they want i mean they live for that so so you 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 know there are also <laughs> this these reports are sent to the chief justice of the high court this is what this guy has done you know these are very i i feel you know i i mean i can tell you i can share it my experience of one judge whom i have regarded as the greatest judge i have seen in my life justice pd desai and uh, you know he as I, i as a young lawyer saw him in gujarat high court for almost 3 uh, 4 years before he was transferred to himachal but he was impeccable in his judicial conduct his heart would bleed for justice and he really you know was so good as a judge in his personal conduct in his rectitude in his courtesies everything and yet he could you know he as chief justice of himachal calcutta and bombay high court he cleaned up the registry well, he could come to supreme he, court he cleaned up the re- registry so brilliantly and 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 i i'll tell you one thing in uh, uh, friends tell me that in maharashtra when he was bombay high court chief justice he had reviewed every judge low, sub, lower court judge judges record personally to see who should be promoted and who should not be promoted it he would never leave it to his uh, colleagues he himself would review them and he would you know then only he will make recommendations so one chief justice as you rightly said uh, you know sometime back one chief justice can make or unmake an entire judiciary in a state and that's what is happening that we are not able to today and that's where collegium is failing that when it appoints judges as chief justices to various high courts it's not even taking note of the fact whether these chief justices are capable administratively to do something good for the institution of judicial in the state so it's it's so i don't know whether and also going back to that issue your, your judges are punished i mean murli dhar justice murli dhar was punished for the order that he gave justice koreshi was punished for the order that he gave so therefore this this message goes down the line that if you're going to pass orders like this this is going to happen to you no this is a peculiar thing that is happening right now because of the sort of very strong almost fascist executive that we have and because of so it happened it happened during congress time it, emergency justice shade and Ju- chief justice divan were transferred from gujarat high court absolutely and but justice shade had the courage to challenge his transfer in the high court and late mr sirvai came and argued that i went to hear i mean it happened then but it's rampant now that's the difference but bar also showed exemplary courage during the emergency and the judges too and the judges yes. and we do not have a declared emergency but it's missing on both sides yeah absolutely i i feel that pushback must come from together a combination from judges and the bar i think what the chief justice should do or what judges should do is to have a conversation with us right 
and then take that forward because we want the institution to flourish and thrive for the people of this country. But if you see, whenever the judiciary does anything good or which is seen to be kind of uh, uh, in favor of fundamental rights and democracy, etc., there is such applause from the people, there is such yeah. praise from the people that uh, this is one thing that people should realize in the judiciary that uh, public opinion will stand with them when they stand with the constitution and fundamental rights. And I entirely agree with you. I think some of the seminal judgments that have come recently, the result of, you know, of, of reflecting that you know, desire to do the right thing and people are applauding. And uh, we have great hopes that uh, in the times to come, not things all is lost yet. We, we need many more Pratap Banu Mehtas to write about these issues. And many more people like you and people to like you and you to take up issues. But thank you very much. I think this has been a very fruitful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you. thank you. Thank you.